Isn't it great to be in a community like this? That we have the benefit of being together as a people. I want to look at some scripture today, um, but before I do, let me tell you sort of the genesis of, of this. Before this past summer, the elders of the church uh, sort of deputized about a dozen people to look at who we are as a church. Really three things, the community that we're in, who we are as a church, and what God says in his word, with the goal of coming out and being able to say, okay, given this time and this community and we as a people, where is God calling us to go in the future as we look into 2017? And so I'm excited to share this with you because this is like the, uh, the main part of understanding that message, that understanding of where I believe God is calling us. And I've chosen a really interesting book in the Bible to look at. This morning, I'm going to read from the book of Ecclesiastes, and I'll try and explain sort of the message of this book, and especially of this passage that we're looking at as a direction to go together. If you'll follow along with me, this is the Word of God. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable business. Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Let, let's pray together. Father, you have called us together as a people, and we look to you to lead us, to lead our community in the direction that you want us to go. And Lord, you have placed us in this amazing city, this beautiful city, in such an amazing community of diversity and opportunity and so, Father, I pray that you would lead us. Give us the ability to be led by you and by your spirit. And, Father, give us wisdom to know your way. And um, we thank you for coming to us in Christ and all that we're able to enjoy in him. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. It actually is the factor that is the most determining in success in health, in the good things that we say that we want to have in life. And it may surprise you because health isn't found in your genes, although that's important, and success isn't found in the, in the trajectory of your career, per se. It's actually found in a different place. This couple learned about it, Katie and Mike Stollard. Here they are. And it all happened in sort of an unsuspecting way. It was in 2004 when Katie found out the news through testing that she had ovarian cancer. And it was actually very advanced. And she went through surgery. And you know how after the surgery, you've ever had surgery or a relative has, and you're at the hospital, and right after the surgery, the surgeon walks out and to sort of give you a report about what had happened. The first two words out of the surgeon's report to Mike were simply, I'm sorry. He didn't know what would come after that, but what was discovered was that the cancer that his wife had was incredibly extensive. It had gotten into her body, and in such a way that her classification of cancer, the two of them were told that she had about a 10% chance of being cured of having success in treatment. As a result of that, they were referred to Sloan Kettering for intensive chemotherapy for her. 
Now, by the way, let me give you the good news. All these years later, more than a dozen years later, Katie is alive and she's actually thriving. And you say, wow, that's amazing. It's true, Sloan Kettering is amazing. They have amazing uh, doctors and programs there. But you need to know that her healing didn't come about just because of that. And actually, the, the source of the drive that led her on the path of healing didn't come from a medical professional at all. Here's Mike explaining. On our first visit, as we got within eyesight of the 53rd Street entrance in Midtown Manhattan, a larger-than-life doorman named Nick Medley locked his eyes with Katie and smiled at her. Little did she know at that moment, she was not just meeting somebody, this person would be her ultimate cheerleader to walk with her on that journey toward healing. His name is Nick Medley. Here's a picture of Nick. And he's actually the concierge at the hospital. And you think like me when I read this story, how could the concierge be so important to healing? How could he make a difference? But imagine this. Imagine showing up for chemo, frightened and already feeling defeated, and being told the odds for your survival are low. And then you're welcomed and you're hugged by this giant of a man, Nick, who says to you, I'm proud of you. I'm going to love you and spoil you back to health whether you want it or not. You see, everyone who comes through that door is in for a fight. And it is the fight of their lives. And Nick learns every person's name. And the name of every relative who comes through the door with them. He learns the name of the cancer that every single one of those patients is fighting. And he greets them every day and hugs them and gives them words of encouragement to lift them up. I'm proud of you, he said to a patient who after six months of chemo finally got the test result where the scans were clear. He gives as many as a thousand hugs every day, speaking support and encouragement and love into each person's life. And what's amazing is he gets all of these letters sent to him like this. I was weary of tests, scared of cancer that had taken over my life, and then I met you. Your true affection is like getting a double dose of adrenaline to fight to face each round of chemo. Little did we know that the most powerful medicine was actually connection. Because if you ask those patients how they survived, how they went forward, they won't tell you about the chemo. They'll tell you about this big guy who encouraged them. And that reflects what we're learning about humankind. That connection is the strongest predictor in your health and in your success as a human being. To produce the thing that we long for in life. You know, we shouldn't be surprised because God created us for community and connection. Without connection, we fail and we wither. But with it, we flourish and we, we thrive. Maybe like you, I was back in Psych 101 in college, and they introduced me to this guy named Abraham Maslow. Have you heard his name? And he was a guy who said, well, let me, let me tell you the way needs work. Here's the picture of it. Down at the bottom, there are the physical needs that we have. Those are the most important, and they come first. And then after them come the social needs, the need for community, and so on. And then after that, a need for meaning and purpose in life. But in looking at Maslow, I started to think, do you know, I, I believe he got it wrong. Think about it with me for a moment. If that tiny baby who is born doesn't have the social need met of somebody to care for her or for him, nothing else matters, does it? Actually, it all starts with the social needs that we have being met, that there's a, a mother or a father or someone who will take that baby and then feed them. But it begins with social nurture. That's the way God created us. None of us would be alive for long. In essence, all the other needs come within a social context. Or as one scientist put it, he said this, most creatures 
get what they need to live from their physical surrounding. Humans, in contrast, get what they need from each other. You see, this is the only way that life works. And God created us to live in this. The reality is, we can't do it alone. We are mutually dependent. And that's what the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless. A miserable business. The writer says this, says, can you imagine being utterly alone? Nobody to give or receive love. Could there be anything more meaningless than this? And here we are over 2,500, like 3,000 years later than this almost, And our studies are bearing this out. Some of the longest-term studies of human flourishing, for example, the 10-year MacArthur study on aging, reached this conclusion. The number one reason for the demise, for, for the sickness of the older population is because of the sense of disconnection they feel as they're getting older that it comes from that. Or the Harvard Grant study, it's one of the longest term studies ever done on human flourishing, measured warmth and connection of relationship and found that connection, quote, positively correlates with individual health, happiness, professional success, and longevity. But the reality is we're not connecting. Our lives are busier than ever and we feel farther apart than has ever been measured in history on this continent. Modern life is not giving us more time for each other, but in a way, more things that are pushing us away from each other. And the reality is that the good news of Christianity, the good news of the gospel, what Jesus came to do was to establish this new community of closeness, mutual respect, love, and sharing. And you see, we believe that we're called in a city like this to be used by God to to end social isolation and disconnection that everybody feels and to bring people into the love of Jesus Christ. And that's really what I want to talk about and what our vision for Granada for the future is all about, building these lasting connections in our broken world. Now, I chose this book the book of Ecclesiastes for this passage, because the book of Ecclesiastes has sometimes been said this, if Jesus is the answer in Scripture, the question is this book. And repeatedly this book looks at every facet of life and asks the question, okay, can I find meaning there? Is that going to give me ultimate joy and purpose and meaning? And, And actually the second verse in this book reads like this, Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And you're like, okay, this is going to be depressing, right? (laughs) Where's this going? But life can feel this way, right? I mean, it's another day going up down US-1 or up the Palmetto. It's another day of work, of, of, of paying bills, of taking care of my house or whatever that I have. Is there any progress? Is there any real change? All of us have felt this. You see, the teacher isn't being dishonest about the difficulties of life. And as we read through, he says, by the way, if you look at your work, if you thought there, that would give you the ultimate happiness, if hopefully you've been working long enough that you've figured out it, it's not there. Or maybe, he says, you've pursued all kinds of pleasure in your life, and you've invested yourself in that, and, and you really sort of pushed that to the limit. And, and after doing that, you were like, wow, I, I, I still haven't found it there. And you, so life is like this experimentation of finding the place well, where is ultimate joy. And basically the writer, as you're, as you're reading this, he says it's not to be found in any of those places. And so you're reading through the book and you're like, okay, okay where's the good news? But listen to this moment. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? 
Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. So he says in all of this work and all of the things we have to do, there's this amazing bright spot. What happens when people actually connect and share their lives with each other? This is what we are made for, helping each other, companionship, working together, intimacy. That's it. You know, in the ancient world, all of this was expected through your family. You know, you would be born into a family. You'd spend your whole life with the same people. You would often also work with them. They would help you if you married to choose your mate. And that family would just expand in that way. And yet, from the very beginning, and by the way, this happened because when God created the first person, he looked at Adam and he said, it's not good for for this man to be alone. This isn't good. This isn't satisfactory. So he created another. And then the first two people start this family. But from the very beginning, this family is shattered by division and even murder. One brother killing another out of competition and out of envy. And the result, again, through our choices, is we're again alone. We live alone. We eat alone. We feel alone. And in in the culture that we're living in now, this loneliness is is epidemic. Chicago, Chicago Tribune columnist Marla Paul confessed this in a recent editorial. This is what she said. The loneliness saddens me. How did it happen that I could be 42 years old and not have enough friends? I think there are women out there who don't know how lonely they are. And when her column appeared, just letters started to pour in of people saying, I felt the same thing. Business executives, professors, working women and and housewives, all sorts of people saying, I know what you feel because I feel it. One person actually said this, I've often felt that I'm standing outside looking in through the window of a party to which I was not invited. You ever feel that way? I mean, maybe you feel that way when you you go on Facebook, right? Because it's like the ultimate window into everybody else's party. You're like, well, they're off having a vacation. And they're at the party, and I'm not there. And you're just sort of looking at all that, but you feel like you're, you're looking in. And everybody has this feeling. So Jesus shows up, and this is what he says. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He gives us his presence, his spirit. He says, even though our families are divided, my goal is to create a new family that's not about success, not about competition, but it's about love and acceptance. And by the way, the end of verse 12 of that passage in Ecclesiastes says this, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Now I read that and I say, hold on a minute. You were just talking about two working, two lying down together, two helping each other up. Where did these three strands come from? Yes, the connecting cord is none other than God himself, who has the ability to bind us together in a way that our own human community can't do. This is this deeply bonded relationship. So that when Jesus shows up, you know what we're told in Scripture? That he is to be given the name Emmanuel because it means God with us. So the first thing that happens is God comes to you. And he comes to you personally as your loving father. And we become his beloved children, bonded to him by love and the sacrifice of Jesus. So listen to the believers, how they saw themselves. But you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Isn't that beautiful? He's like, you're my precious. You're my special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You see, this is how we become a people. God loves us. We receive mercy. We need forgiveness. You see, the church, the people of God, couldn't come together because they figured it out and they were smarter. Or there was something better about them that God would recognize them and receive them. They could come together because they were loved by God. And they were brought into his family. Listen to a Christian theologian. The church itself is not made up of natural friends 
It is made up of natural enemies. What binds us together is not common education, common race, common income levels, common politics, common nationality, common accents, common jobs, or anything else of that sort. Christians can come together because they have all been saved by Jesus Christ. In the light of the fact that they have all been loved by Jesus himself, they commit themselves to doing what he says, and he commands them to love one another. So he breaks down these walls of isolation. And he says, look, you're now me. You're, you're my people. This possession of mine that I treasure. And because of that, you now belong to, to each other. You, you are connected to each other by my love for you, my forgiveness of you, my saving of you. I, I don't know, years ago I read the amazing story of Coach K. Whether you are a Duke basketball fan or not, I want to tell you a little bit of his story. Even if you don't like him, I want to tell you a little bit of his story because it struck me that this, the story, he learned this in life. And by the way, if you've never heard of Coach K, the reason he's called Coach K is his name is almost impossible to pronounce. And his, that is one of the great mysteries of our time in sports. Okay? But you know how he became successful. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Growing up, he was always only around men. He went to an all-men's high school. Then he went to West Point. And he was around men. Then he went into the military. And finally, when he ended up coaching, he married. And God, there is a God. God gave him three daughters. And so, and so he would sit at night at the dinner table. And he would be, the, the, his three daughters and his wife would all be talking. And he would just be praying for it all to end. You know? Okay? And, and as he was doing that, he began to recognize in them that they were very sensitive by seeing each other and other people. They were sensitive to what people were thinking and what they were feeling. And as he listened, this was all completely new to him. So at first he started talking about the players on his team and his daughters would tell him what the players were feeling and thinking that he couldn't see for himself. So guess what he decided to do? He invited his wife and his daughters to come to practice and to come to the games. And before long, as the players would come out, they would hug the players. And they were encouraging the players. And they were cheering for the players. And they were helping them get to unity and helping them understand what was happening emotionally in the personal lives of all of the players. This beautiful thing was happening. And as a result, the team literally was transformed from being a sports team to really being a family. So much so that in later years when Coach K would go out to recruit players, this is what he would say to them. This is from his, his recruiting speech. We're developing a relationship here. And if you're not interested, tell me sooner rather than later. We're going to form a bond and you're going to be part of this family. Because guess what? When they joined the team, it's like they became a part of his extended family. Can you see how that would affect everything they did? You see, God didn't just come in Christ to create this transaction that would lead us to forgiveness. He did do that, but he said, no, 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 no. Sooner or later, you're going to figure out that this is about being a part of my family, and that's who you are. You're, you're my people. You're a, a chosen people. You see, salvation isn't primarily a transaction. It's a new relationship where we belong to each other, and we are one family in Christ, a new family, a new community, and a new connection. This is what we're told. God's aim in his human history is the creation of an inclusive community of loving persons with himself included as its primary sustainer and most glorious inhabitant. You know, that's God's project in the world, and that's how he's included you. And so if you belong to Christ, you now are a member of this family. Look across the room and see the diversity of people who are around. Okay, don't sneer or laugh. Okay, just sort of look at each other and, and see who's here. And this beautiful diversity that we have as a family. And as a result of that, because we have now joined his family, we now are included in his mission. He's like, okay, you're in the family. You're now a recruiter. 
And so we're unified together by the family that we're a part of and now the mission that we share to get involved in bringing his love to the world because this circle of grace is always expanding. That's God's project in the world. Okay, so if you were not here at Granada five years ago, would you raise your hand? Five years ago. You see what's happening? This is what God is doing in this beautiful, expanding community. The Apostle Paul put it like this. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore God's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So guess what? You're now an ambassador of this family, of this kingdom, so that this family continues to grow, to extend his invitation to people who are all around us. You may have noticed on the cover of your program, there's this, uh, this logo that says, everyone belongs here. Did you notice that pineapple on there? Okay, that is not because we're pushing the Baptist hospital system, okay? And by the way, they weren't the first to use a pineapple. Let me tell you what it means. In the old days, when it was hard to transport anything, in places in the world where it was hard to get fresh fruit, the pineapple became the symbol of incredible sacrifice, hospitality, and welcome because it was so difficult to get. And so in a 17th century painting, here's this guy, I don't know if you see, it's sort of dark, just presenting this pineapple because it's the picture of, I'm willing to, to go to great expense to give you something in life that's sweet and that you will enjoy. This beautiful picture to show sacrifice, love. And this reflects what Jesus has done for us. Making a place for us. Showing the welcome of his love. And this is what we do. We want to be a welcoming people in this city. Because this city is a place where people feel so disconnected and alone. We want to be a connecting place. Because we are meeting people every day who want to be connected to community, all because of grace. Not because we're good people, but because we've been loved. By the way, when many people read that passage in Ecclesiastes, they say, I think that's talking about marriage. I think that's right. Two coming together and being united by God, the third strand, bonding them. But I think it's only partly right. It is how God brings people together wherever he is doing that. And God is calling us to join him in this, not because of our strength, but because of our weakness. We can't unite anybody. We can't save anyone. We, can find, we cannot find the common ground on our own. God must do that through his love. I was recently reading the story of U2. Maybe you're familiar with this Irish rock band. And maybe you don't know how the group began. They, they grew up attending the same church together. And as they were, they first bonded as friends before they ever shared music. But as they shared music, the bond grew even more. You may know the members. Bono, Dave Evans, Adam Clayton, and Larry Mullen. And I share this because it's a beautiful story of community. Because as soon as they were ready to publish their first album, the record company came to Bono and said, you've got to lose the drummer because he isn't the kind of drummer that will work in a group like this. We don't want him. Literally, Bono said this, there's no deal without Larry. In other words, we would rather stay together and not be successful than to be split apart and to, and to find some kind of fame. You see, they realized that it required them to stay together. And their love for each other just reveals how close their, their bond is. The, sort of the crystallizing event in their story for me that I've read is in the 1980s, they were actually touring the United States when in this country, everybody was debating whether we would have a new holiday celebrating the African-American community, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And the country was deeply divided over this, but you too, led by Bono, was totally supportive of it. He said he wanted to bring people together. And as he announced that, they were touring the country, and a result, as a result, he received numerous death threats. One of them said this, don't play in Arizona, don't play Arizona. If you do, don't play Pride. You may know that song as In the Name of Love, because I will blow Bono's head off if that happens. So the FBI came to, to the band 
And they said, we believe this is credible. And in the kind of crowd you draw, it would be easy to have a gun. It would be easy for this to happen. But they felt so committed to presenting the message that was in their mu music, they performed. They were frightened. Bono went on to sing in the name of love. Here's him telling what happened when he did. I just closed my eyes and I sang this middle verse trying to concentrate and forget about this ugliness and just keep close to the beauty that's suggested in the song. I looked up at the end of the verse and Adam was standing in front of me. It was one of those moments where you know what it means to be in a band. He opened his eyes and his fellow bandmate had stood in front of him to take the bullet. And he said, you know, when you're in such a community, when a person is willing to sacrifice and lay down their life for you. When I read that story years ago, I thought that's the story of the gospel, isn't it? Of Jesus saying, you know what, I will stand in front of you and I will take whatever is coming out at you because I love you and I'm for you. And when that happens, and when it's happened to you, something happens in you to bond you to him and to bond you to other people. The beauty of love. As part of that song says, you bring me back to life, and it's all in the name of love. Now let me tell you, these aren't the most talented musicians in the world. There are a lot more talented musicians if you're talking raw, raw talent. But they have a mission and a message. And here's what Bono says. He says, I thank God on a daily basis for my life in you too, because not only did this job put my talents to use, it put my insecurities and weakness to use. And that's the miracle for me. Isn't that beautiful? He says, it's not about my strength. He says, I've learned because right here, even my weaknesses and insecurities are put to use. And I thought, that's the body of Christ, isn't it? You see, we do this not because we're better or because we're so secure or because we have all, everything figured out. We do this because one day a man stood in front of me and he said, I will take it so that you can be free and have life. And that life of freedom in, ends up being finding other people, loving other people, creating a community like this. I, I love you guys so much. I love our church and what God is doing among us. But do we know what that is? And do we feel and see ourselves as a part of that mission to share the love of Jesus? You see, we share together in one mission, expanding the circle of grace. And so I want to ask this, what if like Nick on 53rd Street, out in front of the place where cancer patients are coming, what if you were the person in Miami who is afraid because they're coming to a new city or they don't have the connection of friendship or family yet? What if you were the person who greeted them and welcomed them and said, I'm so glad you're here. There's a community. Everybody belongs here. You're welcome. I want you to be a part of our community. And you are able to do that because you've been so loved by Christ. Father, thank you for what you've done for us in Jesus and the beauty of the gospel. And Lord, that you do work through our insecurities, and our weakness. Father, there's sometimes we're in the city in which there's so many people, there's so many people we don't know. It can be frightening or just overwhelming or numbing. And Father, I pray that you would give us a heart of love because we know that's who you are. That's how you've loved us. And Father, you would enable us to live out of the gospel that has changed us, made us to be a people, and transformed our lives. That we might be known as the welcome center for the city of Carl Gables and greater Miami. And a part of that welcome would flow from your love and your grace. Father, thank you for uniting us and bringing us together, giving us a family and a sense of purpose in, in what we do. And we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to take just a couple minutes to talk about, there's a smaller brochure that you received with uh, the program that you had. It's a little square one. If you'd pull that out, I want to talk about um, what Worth was uh, speaking of. 
and that's everyone belongs here. This is the, the emphasis and the vision that uh, we want to have moving forward. Now, when we had a time to greet, did you guys get to share some stories about how you came here? And uh, how was that first moment to be a part of this? I bet there was a lot of different uh, answers to that question. So uh, this morning I got to speak with Tirso, uh, who was our, our deacon setting up in the morning. And for him, it was just kind of like an, uh, just a, a slow-moving thing. He had been a part of the city for a long time. He knew of Granada through other different ways. And a time of change came in his life, and he was looking for a church. And he said, well, I, I've heard of Granada. Let's go there. Or I talked to Andy, and Andy loves to tell the story of how uh, he met someone on a dating website, and that girl made the first meeting here, and that's how he ended up. The first contact was at a worship service at Granada. And so uh, that was a much different way for him to come and be a part. We all have our story of how that beginning comes. And it's, it's really beautiful that there's always a backstory to that, because God is working in people's lives. There's things going on, whether it's people moving into our city, or changes happening in your family or just a prompting in your in your heart to know that you need to seek God that you need to seek a place where you can hear from God and where you can find a community and people are searching just like we were when we arrived here and and there's that first invitation wherever it might come from that is a key that gets it started for what is going on here and so that's why we're talking about everyone belongs here the reason that we do so many events like a couple weeks ago where we had Hero Sunday or next week when we have a turkey fry or we have three or four Christmas celebrations going on in December and we do food trucks and we just do all kinds of things. Those, one, there's a value in it for us to spend time together enjoying one another and that's important to us. But it's also just very important for us that we give you more opportunities that make it easy to invite someone and say, come, come and be a part of my family. Come and be a part of my church. You're going to be welcome here. You're going to be received here. You can enjoy it. It's, it's a great place for you to grow. Because our goal for that is for anyone in our city to know that they could be here and that they can hear from God and they can grow in their relationship with God. And so that's why we say everyone belongs here. Now, it's not that we need more people here that we're saying that. Because we could be very content with our community group. Or you could say, I come to worship services, I like them. This is good for me, this is good for my family. My kids have a good time, my youth are taken care of. This is a good place for me. It's not that we need more people here that we're doing this. It's that because there are more people who need to be here is why we do that. Is that surrounding us in our city and, and friends of ours and our family members and people around who are driving by or, or who are, are moving into the city, they need this same beautiful community that you've been able to experience. They need to have the same place that you have to be able to come and to be encouraged and taught and to listen. They need to come and be a part of your life and to have encouragement from you through their rough times, and to be able to celebrate with you. And uh, their children need to be a part of our children's ministry, where they can continue to grow and learn. You see, it's not just because we need more people here. It's because we, people need to be here. God is working in their lives and bringing them to that point, and he's sending them here, and we want to be ready for that. There's a great story in 2 Kings chapter 7. Now, in 2 Kings, what was happening in this story in the Old Testament is that an enemy of, of God's people had come and they had surrounded the city and they were doing a siege where they just camped the armies all around and they were going to wait till the city just starved to death and they would just go in and take it and never even have to battle. And so as this progressed, the city was just crumbling. It was, it was chaos as people began to starve and all the things that came from that. And there was four lepers who lived outside of the city because they were kicked out. And as the lepers sat there, they said, look, we're going to die anyway. So we could either starve to death right here, or what if we go to the enemy and maybe they'll have mercy on us. Maybe they'll feed us the last meal. Maybe it'll work out. And so they decide to go and head out to the enemy's camp. And what they didn't know was that in that night, God had provided a miracle. He had sent a rushing sound that sounded like a chariot and an invading army. And in the minds of that enemy camp, they got spooked and they left. And they, they evacuated their tents for fear of their life. And they left all their food and they left all their, their possessions behind. And so these four lepers show up to this camp and... And they just start rejoicing. It says they go from tent to tent, eating the food, drinking the drink, 
taking up all the gold and all the stuff like that, and they're just living it up. So I could just picture these poor, skinny uh, men just going around and got like a big turkey leg in their hand and, you know, a, a gold goblet full of and they're just drinking and enjoying it up. And finally, one of them has this epiphany. He goes, it's not good what we're doing. Today is a day of good news. We have to go back and tell everyone else that the siege has ended and that they can have all of these things that we have. You see, that is where we are. God has blessed you with a wonderful church. God has given you hope and forgiveness and love. That He has, he has restored you and he has brought you to this place. And now as you sit in that joy, you have to say, you know what? There's other people who need this. I have to make room for someone else to come and be a part of this. I have to prepare the way for those who are still starving in the city that need to come and partake of the blessings of the miracle of what God is doing. And that is why we have to be prepared for this. Everyone belongs here. I think uh, an another great example of this is uh, Isabel and Oleg Oten are, are, became members here, and they were invited by the Hofmeyers who are over here. So they invited them, and they were as young professionals in working in public relation and lawyers. And now each family has three kids who have been baptized and are in our, our nursery and in our toddler thing. So our church is growing through invitation, and our church is growing through new life being born in it. And so we want to invest in our children's ministry. That is such a vibrant, growing part of Granada. And we have so many young families, as many of you are here, and your children are now worshiping uh, over in other areas and learning about God and being taken care of by other people. That we want to invest more in that. We want to add staff members so that it could grow. We want to take, if you've been upstairs where the elementary kids meet, we haven't been able to renovate that in a long time. So we're going to transform that so that they can enjoy uh, learning about God and his grace in an environment where it's interactive and it's imaginative. Some of you got to see on Hero Sunday a couple weeks ago how many of our parents were dressed up as Bible characters and taught the kids and how much fun they had meeting and experiencing that. We want want that to be a norm on Sundays where, where it's alive for them and it's fun and it's exciting. So we have to invest in that way so that our children belong here and they are happy as well. Now, I want to show you guys a video that we've recently made uh, so that it can kind of tell this message that I've told to you in a better way. So if you watch this. Everyone belongs here. Granada is a church with people from 40 different nations spanning four generations. It's a beautiful sample of the diversity and vibrancy in Miami. Life can be a struggle. It's hard to make friends away from home and to keep up with expectations. We just want to be accepted for who we are and to take time to hear from God. So this is a place where you can be yourself where you can find your identity in Christ, and you can build lasting relationships with people who understand what life is like in Miami. As you plan to come and visit us on a Sunday, let's take you on a quick tour. Granada is a place for children. We provide engaging programs for infants through high schoolers, and our staff and parents create fun activities to teach children about God. We maintain a safe environment where children are accepted and appreciated for who they are. Relationships are the most important part of our lives. We create a space where you can have a meal or share a cup of coffee and talk about our lives. Our worship services have beautiful music to inspire and motivate you. We focus our teaching on the love and grace of God and how our relationship with Him changes our whole perspective on life. The 930 service honors tradition with choir, anthems, and creeds. And the 1111 has a casual atmosphere with a variety of music styles and family activities. So if you've moved to Miami and are looking for a place to connect, or maybe you've been away from church for a long time and you want a fresh start, we want you to know that you belong here.
Did you guys feel like you got on the Jumbotron at the Dolphin game? Is that, hey, that's me, I know that person. Uh, so, but yeah, we are uh, redoing our websites and, and this is going to be one of the, the key instruments so that people could experience Granada a little bit and understand who we are and how we feel before they even go. Because uh, if you were first time uh, visiting, you might have realized what a difficult step that is if you don't already know someone. You know, it's like, what's this place going to be like? Who's going to be there? What's going to happen? And uh, we had uh, our family that attends in the earlier service, the Schumachers, and they moved here to start to work at University of Miami. And the way that they decided to become a part of Granada is that they had to they go to the website and just say, hey, we're looking for a church. What do we do? And so that was their open door to start here, and they've been a part of us ever since. And so uh, these are very important things. So we're rebuilding uh, the English website so that we could uh, give that feel and to show that out more and working on our social media and community events. But with the, the rapid growth that's coming in to uh, Miami, uh, there's many of it, 65% of the people moving to Miami are coming from other countries. And many of those are Spanish-speaking. And we have a wonderful Spanish ministry. And so Hami is going to come, and he's going to talk about how we want to invest in our Spanish ministry to reach those thousands of people who are moving to Miami to worship in Spanish. Hami? Gracias, Jeff. Y yo sé que muchos de ustedes están preguntando, dice, wow, ¿qué pasó con nosotros? ¿Por qué no aparece ningún hispano allí? Eh, pero la verdad es eso, este es el momento donde Granada ha dado un paso extraordinario, este es el momento donde nos vamos a mover a hacer una promoción muy fuerte de lo que es nuestro servicio en español, de lo que es esta constante llegada de personas de otros países que a mi entender Dios nos está mandando aquí a nuestra ciudad para que nosotros los abracemos, los conduzcamos, los conectemos con otras personas Y ustedes y yo somos responsables de eso. Esta mañana ustedes fueron testigos de algo que usted, muchos de ustedes no saben. La nieta de una familia que hace 30 años atrás, una familia de acá de Granada, miembros de esta comunidad, llegó una familia huyendo de un régimen en una isla en Caribe. Esa familia llegó dividida, llegó la mamá con sus tres hijos. Y hoy... Una nieta de esa familia estuvo tocando con nosotros. Hoy una nieta de esa familia que fue abrazada por miembros de esta comunidad, acompañada, eh, cuidada, respaldada, estuvo con nosotros. Así que este es un momento para que ustedes y yo como comunidad nos dispongamos a participar en esta nueva vida que está teniendo nuestra ciudad y que en serio promovamos eh, qué está pasando en Granada. Pronto, en una o dos semanas, va a estar un video muy parecido, de muchísima calidad, en español, en, en nuestra página web. Vamos a tener una página web en español y se va a llamar iglesiagranada.com.org. Así que todavía no pueden abrirlo, pero en unas dos semanas, tres semanas, vamos a tener algo muy especial, muy bien presentado, para que ustedes puedan eh, conectar a otros amigos eh, de la comunidad con este servicio, lo que está pasando aquí en Granada. Estamos trabajando en unas nuevas locación para los niños. Estamos trabajando en unas nuevas instalaciones para los jóvenes. Worth decía algo interesante en el sermón. Tal vez, bueno, no lo único interesante. Él dijo muchas cosas interesantes. Pero tal vez una de las cosas que más conectó conmigo es, es no, ustedes y yo estamos en el negocio de construir relaciones que duren para siempre. Y eso no se puede hacer de otra manera si no empezamos con nuestras nuevas generaciones, si no empezamos con nuestros niños, si no empezamos con nuestros jóvenes a disipularlos, a enseñarles, a entregarles un ambiente seguro con principios firmes, con principios que no se van a acabar, no vamos a lograrlo. Y nosotros estamos empeñados en eso, en Granada lo vamos a hacer. Así que ustedes son bienvenidos a participar en eso, los invitamos a que juntos participemos en la transformación que Dios está enviando a nuestra ciudad. Usted es parte de eso. En español tuvimos mucha dificultad para encontrar el nombre, pero me parece que encontraron el perfecto. Dice, aquí hay un lugar para ti. No sé si lo tengamos. Oh, sí, mire qué bonito se ve eso. Aquí hay un lugar para ti. Y queremos que le digamos eso a las personas de nuestra comunidad. En Granada hay un lugar para ti. Así que gracias por su compañía. Gracias por su participación, involúcrese en la, en la medida que pueda, haga un sacrificio 
Yo diría para el resto de su vida que estamos invirtiendo en una generación nueva que Dios nos está poniendo acá. Thank you. Gracias, Amin. So, Amir es el más guapo y más amable pastor de todos los pastores de Granada. Este Amir, sí. So, uh, now, so here's what I want to talk about as we get to the end. Inside your brochure, there's also a response card. We're going to talk about what we can do to make these things happen. Um, the first thing we want to ask for you to do is to pray about this, okay? Uh, God has brought each one of us here um, by his design. There's a reason that we're here, and we all have a part in making Granada what it is. And so I want you to begin to pray about what that is, whether it's um, areas that you should be volunteering in, or there's uh, people that you could be connecting with and encouraging, or there's things that you could give and do. But really ask God, what is my role here in this community? How can I be building it, and how can I be building it for the next generation for those who are coming in? Then we can all invite. So whether you use your social media or whether you just uh, use the printouts that we give to you, uh, or just by invitation, just uh, the, the way that you make friends and, and talk to people, invite people to come and be a part of it. It's a beautiful thing uh, that God is doing here in our lives, and so everyone is always welcome to any event. Now, you know, we have the turkey fry next week, and uh, you have an invitation there that you're able to post out. Then next week, we'll give you all the Christmas invitations and events that we have. We give that because we want you to share. We want you to know that there's, there's an empty seat for someone, that there's an open spot at the table at any of our events, whether it's our our large worship service or some of the smaller things that we do like community groups and Eagle and Child and Bible studies. All of those things are great ways to get someone started as well. And finally, it's important that we give in order to make these things happen. I want to talk to you about three ways uh, for you to think about giving as a part of this. Now, this past year, this uh, fall and compared to last fall, God has blessed us to be able to grow by 7% already. He is sending more people uh, to Granada through all these different ways. And so there's more for us to serve and more for us to do. But we've been able to uh, to minister and to continue that growth because last year at the end of the year when we had these same conversations, uh, you gave, we together gave $335,000 in the last two months last year and the previous year before that the same. And so when we talk about giving, I want you to think of that and think about if there's more that you could do in order to continue what God is doing so that more could come. First, there's 131 families that give a percentage of their income every month so that Granada can function. Sustainable growth is very important. If we're inviting people here and we're having children to come and be a part of our children's ministry, we want you to stay forever. We want you to stay for a long time. And so as Granada grows, we have to grow our monthly and regular giving. And so if you aren't yet a part of that program where you look and you say, hey, talk to your family and look at what uh, God has blessed you with and say, hey, as a family, we're going to give every month this amount. We would love for you to make that step. Many families already do that. In fact, that's the lifeblood of Granada is people who consistently give and say, this is our church, this is our home, this, we make this a part of what our family does. And so we invite you to join them as one of the steps. Now, for those of us who already are doing that, and you say, we're already coming to that, we ask that you just pray to see if there's more that God would allow you to do. And that there, if there is more, that you would take that step of commitment and you would say, I want to be able to give more so that I could see what God does more in next year as he continues to send people. And then the third thing I want you to think about is, is sometimes uh, the end of the year giving, you're able to make a significant gift because uh, maybe end of the year bonuses or way that you do your accounting or investments that come in and, and there's certain things. And so uh, a lot of people choose at this time of the year to make a significant gift. And we, we offer um, many ways to do that. Some people do it through cash or through uh, actual gifts of property or stocks. All those things are all we're able to handle. You can contact our financial office if you have questions about it, but saying, I can give a gift at the end of the year when I look at all the things that, that I've gone through the year and say, this could jumpstart our budget for next year and what we're doing. And that's another great way to look at it as a Christmas gift or as an end of the year bonus that you are able to give then to your church. And we greatly appreciate that. Now, 
you have a response card there. We'd love to receive those back because we want to know how you're receiving this excitement. Uh, as leaders of the church and the elders and, and as staff, we get very excited about what God is doing. And, and we know as you get to see the things happening and the stuff that you're a part of. But that response card is one way that you say, we're excited about this too. And we're, we're moving forward with it. And we'd love to receive that. Now, I ask you to make some pretty big financial decisions, so you don't have to drop that card in right away. We're going to sing a song, and there are plates at the front and the back that you, if you say, hey, I already know what I'm going to do, and I'm going to drop that in there, you're welcome to do that. We have the offering plates. But for many of you, I've asked you to talk about like a long-term commitment, and you need to go home and talk to your family, or you need to you know, look over things. So you're not pressured to respond right away, but we would like to hear that response sometime. So you can mail it back in or any of the next worship services you attend, you could just come and drop it off inside that envelope in the offering plate. Uh, whatever it is, even if you're able to give financially, put that in there. If you're not, just write a note about how you prayed and what you thought God was moving you to do because we love just to hear of how God is pressing you individually to be a part of the larger community because that's how God is growing it, through each one of you, not through some big organization moving forward. It's how he moves in your life. And so I would love to hear from that. It's very exciting when you respond to what God is doing, okay? The last thing I want to say before the band comes up, this is from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. And it's the verse that is summarized on the back of your brochure. It says, now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Band, would you guys come?